It is Nomi's panf thingy. Nomi looks up from their hall screen and smiles when they see you enter the lounge. Hey, Selena, nice day, huh? So about that picture you posted. Uh, okay, sure. They put their stylus down. It's, a, it's you and Rex, right? Nomi's face goes completely red and they stare up at you in shock. Uh, uh, how did you know? It it totally was. It was. Oh my god. They flop against the back of their couch and curl up into a ball, kicking their feet in the air. I don't know what to do. He's so cool. And not just cool. He's so nice and helpful and, um... I mean... They look away embarrassed. I have eyes, you know. Even if I'm not really interested in that kind of stuff, I know he's a super galactic hottie, too. Like, an 1100,000 gajillion out of 10. Nomi grabs a pillow and hugs it to their chest. He's my best friend in the whole universe. I... Love him, right? He says he loves me, but I don't know what that means. What if... What if I dated Rex? For real, real. They take a deep breath and hide their face against their pillow. But he really likes... Um, you know... Sex stuff. Nothing could go wrong with this plan. I know, I really like him! Nomi replies, unaware that you're being sarcastic. He's so good and he... He makes me feel... Mars, who's in the lounge painting her nails, perks her head up and listens curiously. Nomi shrinks into themselves and lower their, lowers their voice. Sometimes I think about, um, kissing Rex, they confess, picking out a loose thread on the pillow. It makes me feel kind of weird, but in a good way. I just feel like if there was ever gonna be anyone for me, Rex is a pretty good choice, right? What do you think, Solana? Rex wouldn't make you uncomfortable. Cat, huh? Exactly. Me too. Me too, Kalo. You remind Re Nomi that Rex is a very good boy and they giggle and they cover their eyes. I know, he's the best boy. <sighs> I know some of the adults in the colony have open relationships. Sometimes, Cal talks about how one of his mom's boyfriends doesn't live with them and some do. And it's different, but it's still okay because people are happy and that's what matters, right? I don't mind if Rex, um, does stuff with other people. It makes them happy, and I think all I need all I need to be happy is to know that we're always going to be there for each other. Together forever. He is etchy. Banish that woman from No They Are they Nomi blushes again looks at the ground. And maybe we could kiss sometimes? I think I'd like that. Confess. Confess to him. Where's the event? Uh, do I have to wait another day? That colony is a whole or- No, there's just polyamorous people here. Tutor kids. Mara sends you a message that she's looking for tutoring in bio. You ask for more info on what subjects in specific. And she responds that she's struggling primarily with anatomy, specifically the reproductive system. You pin the message and reply that she should contact Instance for any further questions. <laughs> oh wait, 42? Can I, like... Oh my god. What do you two? Seven? Okay, this works. Polyamory and orgies are not the same thing, Hollow. 
Also, in this society, they do artificial insemination. They don't do it the... The current... The way. That you commonly know. Uh, okay, since I don't need to go outside anymore, do tutor children again. Try to get this up as much as possible. everything's fine. That this is a strange kid, your mom says, stopping for a second to wipe her brow. I was worried about him when it felt like he wasn't fitting in with the other kids, but now he just goes wherever he wants. Whatever he wants. It's dangerous. You should talk to him. If anyone can get through to him and get him to start thinking about himself as a member of our community, uh, community again, it's you. Everything seems fine here. <gasps> You're walking through the colony gates when you turn a corner and almost run into Nomi and Rex standing together, sharing an umbrella and having a serious conversation. Nomi looks flustered and anxious while Rex's expression is patient. Listen in on them. You duck behind a trellis, just in time to see Nomi thrust a crumpled envelope in Rex's hand hands bowing slightly. Rex smiles gently as he opens the envelope and reads the letter. He watches his expression- oh my god, she's so anime. Watch his expression go from impatient to, to surprised before settling on affectionate. Nomi, this is so sweet. I didn't know you felt that way about me. Nomi just twists her hands together anxiously. That's, um, it doesn't have to be a big deal, okay? I don't really know how I feel exactly. I just- I just know that I really like you. You make me feel, um, confused and scared sometimes, but in a good way. Nomi, Nomi, you don't ever have to force yourself to do anything uncomfortable. Or anything that makes you feel uncomfortable. Not for me, not for anyone. You know you and me are forever, right? He strokes her cheeks with both his thumbs. I love you just the way you are. Nothing you do or don't do is just gonna take- it's gonna change that. It's not like that. I feel things for you and- that I've never thought about anyone before. Oh yeah? Like what, Nomi? Rex says, a bit of his usual teasing humor coloring his tone. Uh, unholy things. JK, she said kissing. Rex barks out a friendly laugh. Kissing? Nomi, you dirty bird. Well, I never. He teases, and Nomi laughs and gives him a little push. Okay. This is getting a little too intimate for me. And I don't feel like reading out loud. Oh my god. Rex- okay, anyway. <laughs> okay, by the way. Rex and Nomi look into each other's eyes for a long time until Nomi lets out a little sob and their shoulders start shaking, crying in sheer relief. Nomi, hey, come on, did you think I'd say anything else? Nomi hiccups. I- I didn't know. Rex smiles gently. Well, now you know. There's another long pause where they just look at each other, grinning like fools, until Rex clears his throat. So, uh, you want your first kiss now? Yes! Nomi exclaims through their happy tears, throwing their arms around Rex's shoulders. Rex leans in the rest of the way to kiss them sweet and slow. You turn and slink away, giving them some privacy. Rex and Nomi are curled up together on a large couch. Rex's big arm wrapped around Nomi's smaller form, her face buried into the back of her neck. His face buried into the back of her neck. Nomi blinks sleepily up at you. Oh, did we fall asleep? And what Rex, who snuffles awake and kisses Nomi on the cheek. Nomi goes pink and giggles. Th sorry, Selena. Uh, did you need something? Oh my god, PDA.
No Twitch clips? What do you mean? Oops. Hold on. Together. All right, let's look at the gold again. We got special piece, stop tang. I don't know about choosing career, so. What happens if I assist the governor again? Kind of expected Mars would go a little easier on you, seeing as you helped her become governor and all. Unfortunately, she's come to see you as the only person she can trust to do a good job because she saddles you with a lot of work as her assistant. The fact that she likes to make you sweat probably helps. Mars kept Lum around as her own personal social media manager, so long as that's the one job you don't have to do. So at least that's one job you don't gotta do. He's not bad at it, since being charismatic is basically his only skill. Besides, Chief Rhett won't let him anywhere near the garrison. Sometimes, Lum treats you like you're still his assistant. But he's not your boss anymore, and Mars makes sure he knows that. Your job mostly consists of managing Mars's packed schedule. She became governor by essentially promising everyone on the council that she'd listen to their concerns, and her promises are coming home to roost. Ugh, <sighs> it sucks to be popular. Mars sighs, scrolling through her calendar. My schedule overfloweth. You dealeth witheth. Yes, my queen. <laughs> oh, she did it like that. Oh, you can post links in Discord, at least. They don't want to meet with you. They're only meeting with her because they think they have to. Most of the meetings could be hollow messages, honestly. She doesn't have to actually be there in person to get them to listen to her. Yeah, you're probably right. Thanks for giving me a reality check. She looks pleased to know that her words carry weight, even without being backed by her considerable presence. That doesn't solve the problem of how to manage all this these scheduling conflicts, though. How are we going to... Wait. This is totally an assistant's job. Let me know when you figure it out. You can feel Seek staring daggers at you from nearby, disappointed that they weren't trusted with this menial task. Work hard. You wisely combine several meetings with similar topics, avoiding people who you know will argue with each other. You cancel a few other meetings, starting hollow messages and copying Mars to the thread. You remember to give Mars a few hours midweek for her spa time. One thing Mars learned from Lum, it's image that matters. A governor with frizzy hair and dry skin won't be taken seriously. Oh wait, 47? Wait, I don't have the last card. Finished assist the governor. As assistant, you have great access to a deal of info that would have otherwise been classified. Classified. It's only your it's only your sense of propriety that keeps you from looking up the resolutions of arguments long past or records of complaints against people you know. Kind of sad how most of the governor's work is just mediating conflicts. Seems there are some things that humanity still couldn't leave behind on Earth. That didn't give me anything either. I want the card. Okay, this is this is not giving me the card. What the heck? Okay, maybe I have to do that offline. Okay. Just max out stuff. Food or children? Oh, wait, I do this. Uh, I 
just wanted to see if I could get close to 75. Yeah, that card can- yeah, I realized that card can only get God if I'm governor. I'll do that offline, all good. I chose the wrong one. Ah! Alright, so that's the last card I'm missing. Tutor kids. Ah, who? Kana. Hagi Kana has always been governor in Canada. Yes, I have. Reasoning, empathy. And again, with your kids. Where's the blue? Increases. Face? You're surprised to see Rex in the garrison. He sticks out like rain dust, rain cloud and dust. What's even more surprising is that he's talking to Vase, and no one's even bleeding. Listen in on them. Carefully approach them, hoping to catch some of their conversation without them realizing you're there. So, just show up at first one tomorrow and I'll show you around, he says. He sounds nice. This is pretty weird. Rex scratches the back of his head. Alright, sounds good, but... And I'm not complaining. I'm still not sure why you're doing this. He says quiet for a long time, letting the sounds of the garrison fill the silence. <sighs> Look, Rex, I did you dirty, man. I was a dishonorable piece of shit. I used to make your myself. I used you to make myself feel better because if people were beating up on you, they wouldn't be beating up on me. You were always so bloody happy all the time, like it didn't bother you. I kept letting it happen. Rex huffs a, sh huffs a short, humorless laugh and puts his hand on his hips. You did more than let it happen, face. You beat the shit out of me on the regular. Let me fix it then. I can't go back and undo all the hell I gave you, but I can offer you one thing. If people see you hanging out with me, they'll lay off you forever, and I'll make it real bloody clear that if anyone ever lays a finger on you, they'll answer to me. Ace clenches his fists at his sides. I don't expect you to be my friend or even forgive me. I'm just saying, sorry, and I want to try to get people off your back. Rex considers this heavily. All oh, right, he says with a faint but hopeful smile. He sticks out his hand and Vase stares at it warily before taking it. First son tomorrow. Better not try to put me in date uniform, dog. Deal. But, uh, you could try to cover up a little bit. Rex's laughter bounces off the high ceilings. You decide to sneak back the way you came before they notice you eavesdropping. Yay! And today's the last day. Let's work in construction. After Seek, the unofficial heads of the construction crew are Luminan and Burnish. Ours is dads. You don't know them very well, but they're super they're great supervisors. Help them work. Knowing the attack is coming as it always comes in glow, does nothing comes to call does nothing to calm your nerves. There's only so long you can handle sheltering in your quarters. After as the months draws longer, you find yourself almost compulsively walking the walls when you're not working, scanning the tree line for the first sign of trouble. You're there when you see them. Dark on dark shapes coming out of the forest perfectly silent. You watch with the lookouts as more and more figures amass at the forest's edge. Minutes pass as the horde pushes on the, into the firebreak, numbering at least 
Must be the thousands. More animals than you've ever seen in one place. The ground is choked with the teeming carpet of smaller creatures darting in and among the legs of... No. Oh no. The forest bends as faceless emerge from its depths, followed by two more. The mood on the walls is discouraged. One faceless destroyed your colony, but two faceless required... One faceless destroyed your colony. Two faceless required an irresponsible number of explosives to take out. How are you supposed to handle three? Wait, there's even more? A familiar being cuts through the horde and stands at the front like a general leading their army. Gardeners must come in all shapes and sizes, but you know this one from the hatred in their eyes. It's Noctilucent. Noctilucent steps forward. For millennia, I have been tasked with keeping this planet safe from invasive species. Extreme weather, plague, famine, the migration of predators. All tactics I have used to ensure an invasive species cannot find a foothold where they do not belong. Their command of human language has vastly improved since you saw them last. The gardeners will qu learn quickly. Controlling you by indirect means has proven ineffective, they say, glaring up at the row of horrified colonists atop the walls. I can no longer ignore the destruction you have caused and the threat you represent to the planetary ecosystem. However, Sim steps out of the tree line and stands behind Noct stands beside Noctilicent. His eyes find yours unerringly across the firebreak. Some gardeners argue that you have the capacity for reason, so I have come to offer you an alternative. Your unconditional surrender. Noctilucent smirks up at you. Surrender is the correct word, is it not? Something your singular violent brains can understand. The terms are simple. Humanity will cease reproduction, cease expansion, and in return will be allowed to live out your remaining lifespans within the bounds of your walls. You accept. Mara steps forward. She beckons you forward, too. This is the movement you've been trying to make happen. Solana, there's no way people are just going to accept never having children. That's just... We'll go extinct. Can't you make them give us a better deal? You look down at Noctilescent, a figure of malevolent patience across the firebreak. Might be the only chance you get, but you can try. The overseer did not mention that the slow extinction of humanity was part of their deal. The other colonists would never accept something as drastic as forced sterilization, like living pets or curiosities in a zoo dwindling into oblivion behind these walls. You wouldn't even ask them to make that choice, which leaves you to... We need a better deal. Noctilescent's patience is running out. Behind them, the amassed animal army lies in wait. The offer is already generous. Do you think I consulted with the venomous slapfingers when they overhunted the abyssal striftworms? Or the creeping cross foreign vine when it choked the, the southern shoreline? No. I did what was needed to restore balance, as my gardener directive entails. Sim lays his hand on Noctilescent's arm. Humans can be reasoned with. Just hear them out. Please, he says firmly. He turns to you. What do you propose, Solana? You must be allowed to reproduce. Restore balance, return to Monk. <laughs> You're well spoken for, Pest. Noctilusim concedes. However, is humanity even capable of considering the survival of all creatures over their own, even if it means accepting limitations? Of course we are. Six. Two. You argue that the success of the Rotumna project in leaving Earth shows that you've learned from your mistakes. Maybe humanity as a whole wasn't able to change trajectory back on Earth, but the colony self-selected those that could. Noctilescent listens to all this, looking a little more convinced. 
Have you learned anything from living here, though? Can you even coexist with this planet's native wildlife? Of course. Wahoo. Dr. Lesson seems impressed. You've learned all that in ten years. It seems you aren't completely ignorant. Very well, they say, motioning for the army to stand down. You have argued your case and shown you can adapt to your surroundings. The new terms are? The Overseer has agreed to grant humans reproductive autonomy and limited expansion within your ecological niche. Additionally, the gardeners will ensure the continued health of this valley, fertile soil, clean water, favorable animal migration patterns, and so on. Behind you, the colonists are beginning to carefully come forward to listen, murmuring with wonder. Be clear, there will be no hunting, clearing, mining, or expanding beyond the valley. Humanity must live in harmony with nature rather than attempt to control it. You will come to understand that you do not stand above the needs of the planet. Your mom comes up beside you and puts her hand on your shoulder. It's what we've wanted this whole time, she says in disbelief. Left Earth, this is everything we dreamed we could be. But the Helium arrived, in mil on, arrived on a military mission, carrying their burdens from Earth and may resent any deal with the gardeners. This decision might not be popular, but it will give humanity a chance at peace. A true peace. We agree to your terms. The animals surrounding the colony begin to filter back into the trees, disappearing into the gloom of the late glow wilderness. Your knees buckle. You feel like you could sleep for a week. All around you, you hear people crying, in relief, maybe, or fear. Tears pour down your face, unbidden as the colony comes out to clamor around you. Many are smiling. Some look numb and scared. Some look angry. It hasn't sunken in yet, even as you're hoisted onto someone's shoulders and paraded back into the colony. You did it. You've won. The party continues well into the night and for a few days after that, until the sun rises above the horizon once again. It begins to set in the colony that will never again see another monster attack, or famine, or plague. Most people think this sounds pretty good. Others are soundly overruled for now. As for you, now you can focus on just being your best self without worrying about day-to-day -day survival. That relief carries you through until quiet breaks out on a new year, your 20th birthday. You turn 20 amidst a time of tremendous joy and unity in the colony. You're not a teenager anymore, so you guess that makes you an adult, though in many ways you've already been one for a long time. You step out onto your balcony to greet the new day and start the rest of your life on Rotumna. The end. Yes! Oh shit. What am I? I'm a lawyer! Oh man! Is this the worst ending or the best ending? The best ending. Maybe. Building a colony doesn't mean you just erect walls and plow fields. You need to come up with an entire way of governance that ensures peace for centuries to come. Basically, you're a bureaucrat. You help draft the colony's constitution, use the transition to a democratically elected council, and manage the rules surrounding elections. You become an opposition leader. Mars's SFC becomes a de facto political party with her as governor. And as the person who helped elevate her to that position, you are, ne you are uniquely qualified to act as their opposition in your nature to question authority, and you believe it's an important part of any healthy democracy. Your inability to compromise means you never end up with any power yourself, but you make sure that Governor Mars and the Council don't get away with anything they shouldn't do. It's an important job and sometimes bitter, but Mars never holds it against you. In fact, she revels in the conflict. He loves that you keep her sharp. But what about... 
This is a hard person to love, but once he lets you in, he's by your side for life. Wow, a Scorpio for real, for real. He's instrumental to the colony's transition to Gardener Authority. Together, the two of you provide an example of fearless submission to the forces of nature. This actually talks to people about everything he's seen in the wild, the incredible and the horrifying, and champions the idea of being a part of it, not in control of it. The idea that peace with nature involves cooperation and compromise, not subjugation, is unpopular. But being unpopular has never stopped this before. Once you put in the work to get past Dis's, offen Dis's defenses, he proved to love you with the same single-mindedness with which he loves Vertumna. It's a little overwhelming at times, honestly. He's very intense. Oh my god, he is a Scorpio, for real, for real. <laughs> and after growing up an outcast, he can often seem dependent on your attention. And one of the only people he's ever truly loved, you felt like he was loved in return. And felt like he was loved in return. Deprived of it for so long, his hunger for it is bottomless to this point of self-destruction. Something you keep revisiting during your relationship, but never to the point of breaking up. Solana doesn't like clinginess? Okay. You're a bit of an odd bird yourself, and you have your own jagged edges that only do this can soothe. After all, who else would believe that you're stuck in a time loop? You think this is the tappiest ending for Dis? Because he doesn't just run off into the wild by himself on anymore. Dis continues his work as an ambassador for gardenership for many decades until one day he announces that he's leaving. In recognition of his lifetime of service to the planet, the Overseer has extended an offer to make Dis a gardener. A bitter day s it's a bittersweet day for you, tempered only by the knowledge that he'll be in a better place, and that he'll always be watching over you. Literally. He made a lot of friends since his loner years, and his ascendance to gardenerhood is celebrated across the colony, even by tangent, having long reconciled their differences. For years afterward, people report seeing strangely docile an animals approach the colony, watch for a few hours, and then slip away into the forest. It's a comfort knowing this will always be out there somewhere. What about... Strong and true Nem sticks by your side, one of your most trusted friends. You might be friendly towards all, but few people really know her like you. No one's quite sure whether to be to believe Noctilus and really ceases attacks during Glow, but as the years pass and the colony breathes a collective sigh of relief, the garrison's resources eventually get siphoned away into other departments. Nem is downsized, becoming a reservist instead of staying on the, with much with the much smaller standing army that remains. One of her last acts before she retires is dismantling the wall she helped defend. She goes back to playing sports ball and finds her joy again. Running teams for children just like her brother did. Little Nougat grows up idolizing them, just like you both idolized Calm. The relationship with Vase may have been brief, but it was formative. She doesn't throw herself into loving anyone that deeply again for a long time, instead focusing on her own work. They're by her side during her misadventures and dating some of the other soldiers, and once notably Rex, howling with shared indignity and laughter uh, with every awkward breakup. Nam lives a long, happy life, becoming something of a cool aunt figure to everyone who crosses her sports ball pitch. Symbiosis, the bridge between two peoples. Undying, never aging, ever patient Sim remains one of your closest confidantes. Co confidants. For a few years, it's quite common to see gardeners move around the colony in various forms, teaching the humans about the history of Vertumna and how to live in harmony with the land. Sim's one of them, of course, and the only one who doesn't treat you like some sort of curiosity in the zoo. After a few years, the other gardeners leave humanity to figure things out on their own. Sim stays on to act as an emissary and moves into the colony to live with you full-time. You, specifically. You move into a gardener-like abode where Sim can form a connection to the array. Glowing pool and all. It's an odd, it's an odd roommate situation prone to some sitcom-level hijinks as you work out the finer details of sharing a space with an alien. But your friendship helps, an helps him acclimate to living in the colony. You and Sim enjoy the bachelor life for a few years, becoming better friends through your many domestic communications. Miscommunications. He's a good roommate, though a little dense when it comes to picking up when you would like some private time. Please, Sim. Though a few brave souls try, Sim never bonds with anyone in the colony in the romantic sense, but instead cultivates many new friendships. You think Sim enjoys living in the colony, but he never quite fits in. He reincarnates a few times into forms that look more human, but he also once famously returned to the colony as a swarm of hecklebees, just to prove a point about how the gardener's consciousness transcends form. It's a bit unnerving, but that's sim for you. Wait, where's Otto? 
Nomi contribute continues to pursue their dreams as a hollow novel creator, but they never stop dabbling in all sorts of things, just the way they like it. Nomi and Rex continue to date, much to the gentle amusement of every everyone who knows how mismatched their views on relationships are. It takes Nomi a long time to warm up to the idea of getting physical with someone, and they need to feel love and feel comfortable with them first. They're almost vibrating with happiness when they confide in you that, for them, that person is Rex. They're still best friends and life partners, and just good for each other, like two puzzle pieces, differently shaped but fitting together. Nomi supports Rex dating other people. After all, that means they just have more time to hang out with their other best friend, you. They never lose their fascination with retumbing animals. One of their hyperfixations leads them to volunteer as a rancher, where they're working on one fateful day with, when the explorer is bringing in a unisaur. Despite the beast's aggression and capricious nature, something between them just clicks. Nomi becomes the only person who can calm down the fearsome creature, to the point where it will follow along behind them as a gentle as a float cow. <laughs> Nomi's magical unicorn friend is something of a celebrity among the colony. They're a big hit at princess-themed birthday parties. Well, thanks, Trex. Oh, I said oddle instead of oddly? Oh. It's hard to believe that someone like Nomi grew up on the Heliopause. They don't just march to the beat of their own drum. They're their own brass band and acrobat troupe and free candy buffet all in one person. They're your friend, though, so you're thick and thin. Your buddy Rex grows from good boy to good man. He continues to work hard on the bar, turning it into the place he's always dreamed, where people can come and unwind from a long day, enjoy some libations, dance their butt off, and maybe even find love. He gets a reputation for being a matchmaker. In a small colony, there are not a lot of romantic options, but Rex has an eye for figuring out who would be a good match for who. Giving Rex a kiss for luck becomes a tradition among those looking for love. And if some people find something a little more temporary than love with Rex, that's their business. Nomi and Rex continue to date. Oh, this is the same repeat from Nomi's side. Rex and Vase even mend their relationship in time. It takes many years, but it helps Rex that it helps that Rex isn't the kind of person to hold a grudge. Vase even joins you for drinks sometimes, and he and Rex often talk long into the night as if they're old friends. Rex always seems abundantly happy with his lot in life, like crashing on Rotumna was the best thing that ever happened to him. It's remarkable that the Heliopause could have made him could have made someone like him, but you're glad it did. He slows down as time slows down a little as time goes on, mellowing out and becoming more quiet in his self-confidence. He confides in you that his dog genes will probably mean that his life will be a little shorter than the average human's, but that he wouldn't trade any minute of it. What about Face? Continues to Face continues to uh, to try to live up to the hero he sees in himself. Your alliance with the gardeners means you don't have much need for a garrison except to find the peace within the colony itself. Vase finds himself in the role of a security officer and commonly deals with petty crime and community mischief, mainly from young people pushing their boundaries. After Rhett retires his second, Nem takes over as chief of security, and then retires within a few, within a few years at the security, as the security force shrinks. Vase is the obvious choice to succeed her. He's young and he's hungry, and is fiercely protected of the colony. He has worked on his anger issues and keeps his frustration under the control. You're not sure he'll ever understand or grow to like the gardeners, but at least he's civil. Face finds policing boring and a waste of his talents, but he doesn't let himself become resentful or lazy. He protects the colony to the best of his ability, takes pride in serving humanity, and comes home every night content that he's made life a little easier for everyone. He still has a lot of unpacking to do, and it takes time. On his worst days, he just as he was before, quick to anger and quick to fall back on intimidation tactics to get his way. You're able to see through, through to the struggling man underneath, but it takes a toll on his other relationships. Every failed relationship is a mark against him in a colony this small. It takes years before he's ready to be a good partner to someone, and for someone to want to meet him where he is, but it does happen eventually. Ace is overjoyed to be a family man. He loves the idea of protecting something, and having kids provides a good outlet for that. He's still your brash buddy, Vase, but he's easier to be around when he's got a baby strapped to his chest. He mellows out a bit as he grows older, becoming the peace officer the colony needs. He visits the creche often to do safety workshops for the little kids, and he's always a big draw at the annual Vertumnalia dunk tank. After over a decade of friendship, you'd have never guessed Vase was once a colony bully. 
He credits you for kicking his ass to therapy, but he's the one who did all the work. <sighs> the indomitable Marzipan. That's Governor Marzipan to you. Mars learns from her flirtation with capitalism and, true to her word, abandons her plan to turn kudos into a true currency. She wants to raise everyone's standard of living, together, not just create a luxurious nouveau riche on Vertumna. Steering the colony toward undergardenership requires a calm hand. Mars initially chafes at the idea that she can't build a beautiful metropolis of her dreams. However, with much of the external pressure taken off the colony, Vertumna is already a paradise. You people need to labor for subsistence, subsis, subsistence anymore, so more can devote themselves to the arts. Just as Mars has hoped, he springs an unprecedented time, unprecedented time of cultural growth and eventually the luxury she craved, just a little different than she imagined. As for her love life, Mars is never really one to settle down for a little long term. She enjoys a string of lovers, Tangents, Utopia, Rex, again, a number of people from the Heliopause. Everyone wants her, but nobody can cage her. She does eventually have one kid. One child. Just for novelty. She enjoys being the center of attention while carrying a surrogate pregnancy, but enjoys being the child's wealthy, generous auntie Mars upon even more. Mars remains surrounded by as much luxury as one could expect on an exoplanet, and though she complains about wanting more, she never seems anything less than happy about her life. Chief Engineer Tang has a nice ring to it. It always seemed like Tangent's life was laid out for her. Work hard, discover amazing things, and eventually replace Instance as chief engineer. However, after only a year on the council, Tangent surprise ever surprises everyone by stepping down. She says that she simply doesn't have enough time to run engineering and do her research, but you know the truth. She doesn't want to be used, like Instance was. Her brush with genocide made her realize she needed to think more about the repercussions of her actions. Instead, she contents herself with being a regular researcher. Quietly pushing the boundaries of medical science, and having a hand in every major discovery, she trains up new researchers in every disciple, in, in every discipline, passing on everything she learned from instance and everything since. Hi, Locke. No, Otto's not here. It's an unremarkable life for someone as impossibly promising as Tangent, but she seems happy. She smiles more often, has more time to spend with you, and gets more than enough sleep every night. Her love life remains fairly private, though she's not as frigid as she's always claimed. You hear from the colony gossips that she carries on with a string of casual relationships, mostly with other scientists, mostly with women. She donates genetic material to a number of children, but she doesn't choose to raise any of her own. She's quite picky about their genetic enhancements, obsessing over any markers of anxiety or depression that run in her family. But ultimately, her children grow up healthy and in loving families far removed from Tang's own childhood. It's a bittersweet reminder for her. Tangent lives and dies in the shadow of knowing what she almost calls to happen on Rotumna. Knowing that she almost killed every living thing on the planet weighs heavily on her for the rest of her days. Unfortunately, even with genetic alter alteration, the human body was not made to withstand long periods of without sleep. And Tangent's willful negligence, is negligence in taking care of herself doesn't exactly help. She develops, a, she develops a heart condition in her early 60s that outpaces the healing capacity of the medbeds, and it eventually takes her life. Oh my god, there's so many! Your friend, your friend Cal grew up, but he never lost his boyish charm. Thanks to the gardeners enticing nearby plants to grow heavy with fruit and nuts for the colony, Cal gets to do what he loves, getting dirty and growing things for fun. He never has to deal with the burden of providing for the colony as your parents did. The planet provides everything you need. Al and Tammy formalized their relationship after a few years. Before the colony, they state their intentions to live together, loving and caring for each other as a family unit. It's a beautiful ceremony. Echinacea is the first of many children they raised together. Together, they have a tidy little sum of children, and that's the only tidy thing about them. Children grow up digging in the dirt, eating bugs, nearly getting mauled by farm equipment, and having a great time being kids. Al dotes on every one of them and adores his partner, Tammy. Fox just keeps getting bigger and it seems she might live to be hundreds of years old. With the colony at peace, Cal is able to convince Rhett to release Socks into the wild. After a tearful goodbye, you're there with Cal to see her off into her forever home, where she belongs. Cal himself becomes an example for the other colonists, becoming somewhat of a spiritual leader for those who accept their rule under the gardeners. He lives a long and happy life, ages gracefully, and outlives you. 
Your friend Tammy blast blossoms into a fine mother, not just to her own kids, but to every person in the colony who needs a mother's love. Cal and Tammy's commitment ceremony is the event of the decade, bedecked with flowers, streamers, and holographic images of unicorns and fairy tale castles. They stand before the colony with echinacea and profess their intentions to live together as a family unit. A foregone conclusion for most, as Tammy's already beginning to show her second pregnancy. The three, soon four, and many more of them, are a symbol of hope for your growing colony. They live on a homestead near Geoponics, and their home is always filled with love and laughter. Tammy insists on cooking for you for your weekly family dinners, and she even gets begins to get pretty good at it. Quite without meaning to, Tammy becomes an advocate for the communal raising of children, just as you yourselves were raised. The more militant Helios resists, not wanting to associate with the Stratus's hippie nonsense, but as the colony grows, so too does her influence over the next generation. Uncle Tonin couldn't be more proud of his daughter, or his score of grandchildren. He dotes on them relentlessly whenever he's home from expedition. Though Aunt Anne stays on as the chief steward well into her 90s, Tammy takes over the new crate and becomes something of a mythical fi figure to the colony. Auntie Tammy, in her own right. There's no child who doesn't know the safety and warmth of Tammy's arms. Your parents get to see their pioneer dreams come true. With the forest bursting with food, they're both able to lay down the burden of feeding the entire colony. They still work in geoponics, but recreationally. Your dad cultivating dizzy weed and hops, your mom working on her personal garden of earth plants. Now that the gardeners are keeping an eye on the colony too, her earth plants flourish without threatening to take over the local flora. They live long, happy lives, and you eventually return them both to the soil they love so much. They'll always be with you. In the ground you walk on, in the trees that give you shade, and in the cycle of life that sustains you. Your hot eye is a good companion, and you're no but you're no replacement for its own species. When a herd of hop eye roam close enough to the colony, you release it back into the wild. And after a few years, you're greeted one morning by a whole litter of hop eye kittens outside your door, and hop solo, proudly showing off their family. Hi, Liz. Your Riki grows from the size of a small dog to the size of a bear, becoming more and more unwieldy and more terrifying to small children before the council can force you to do anything about your arachnid's octopus friend. Riki Tiki just disappears. You look everywhere in the colony for it, but your answer comes from outside the wall. A new Riki nursery tree. Soon the colony is a host to many curious Riki pups who call your Riki Tiki home. But what about your Unisaur? Will seemingly live forever, just as cantankerous as she's always been. Twilight Sparkle's bored in the colony, though, and ultimately, even though you've made great strides in taming her, you'll never domesticate her or her species. You decide it's best to release her into the wild. She deigns to give you a regal nuzzle before sprinting off into the swamps where you found her. And in my later years... The days turn to months, eventually becoming years and then decades, and before you know it, you're old. You live in harmony with nature. Living under the gardeners, lovingly tended like any other species in the garden is like a paradise. The trees are heavy with fruit, the weather is mild, and the colony is unbothered by the larger xenofauna that once menaced the colony. You even see faceless ones sometimes, sitting in clearings like inert sentinels, their broad mossy bodies home to clusters of small animals. Over the years, a few dissenting groups refuse to believe that the entire planet is off-limits to humans. In the spirit of human expansion, they break off from the colony in search of somewhere outside of the gardener influence. Some return, chastised, but others never do. Pruned, just like any invasive weed. The surveyors work exhaustively to map the boundaries of the human territory, and the scientists and engineers work on countless simulations to test its carrying capacity. Within a few years, you have concrete numbers about how many humans can live comfortably while still maintaining equilibrium with the planet. Mother Vertumna is generous, and humanity flourishes. There's more than enough space to live, and for future generations to enjoy as well. You do so well, in fact, that a gardener emissary comes to you with an offer. A second human territory. It's a show of trust, but also a chance to prove your worth by helping keep down the population of a stubborn but delicious invasive mollusk. They've prepared a protocolony and take 100 humans to begin their new lives as a seaside community. You're sad to see them go, but it's a great sign for the future of humanity on Vertumna. Vertumna's your home now. Did we get a golden ending? Yes! And you've made it a good one. You die at a ripe old age, surrounded by loved ones. In the moment of your death, as your brain cells fizzle out one by one and shut down forever, a vision swims into your mind's eye. That... a person? He seems so familiar. 
You feel like you know them so well. Oh, you. Only ancient. Her arms are covered with so many data bands. Many lifetimes of knowledge. The ancient you speaks without moving her mouth. Not in words, but in something like pictures. Still, you understand. She greets you so love you can feel suffused through your soul. You did well. It's not easy to make someone un put aside their ego and surrender to a greater power. Humans have tried before and it has not always been pretty. Her hand rests on your shoulder. I hope you can manage to do it again, because you're not done yet. Hi, Dervy. Bruh, Kanahaku narrates so much in one go, you're so strong. Practice. Two years of practice. Oh wait, so almost three years of practice. Yeah, Khan is an excellent narrator. Thanks, Liz. I was also reading chat. Yeah, I'm reading the epilogue. Jeremy's becoming a jet main. Well. Don't worry, Liz, I already said it. Okay. I live my best life. We've been a good keeper to our friends and family, haven't we? We're no strangers to death, but it's still a good cheat. It's still good to cheat it every once in a while, isn't it? We have a chance to take another path. To change the way our life turned out. She reaches out her hand. Come with me. Okay, so the, the whole thing went on so long that the song played and went. But look, we got the lore ending. Wahoo. Oops, I, I tabbed out of that. Alright, we're done though. Look at all the illustrations I got. I will deal with this later. All the backgrounds done. Yes, that's the final ending I wanted to get. The best ending. We made peace. And look at all the cards I collected. I'm missing one, but that requires me to be governor. But I'm not going to do that on stream. <sighs> and all the achievements. This one requires me to get all 29 endings. So that'll take a while. And these are just deck manipulation things. Oh yeah. I'll I'll get those later. But yay, we're done. Everyone's on the screen. Yay! Good night, Timochi. Did you get the secret ending? I did. Uh you the earth things? Yes. And then blowing up the wormhole so that we couldn't go back? Yeah. I did- okay, that was done in the- the worst route. Watching the stream was so good actually. Aw, thanks Kona. But yeah, that's it for- I was a teenage exocolonist. Any achievement farming I do, the last like four or five things I need are going to be done off stream. And yeah. Thank you again, Timochi, for recommending this game for me. It was a lot of fun. Hmm. Kana's new favorite game. That is self-proclaimed. By Timochi. Okay. It's a good thing I don't have to talk tomorrow. Now it's time to scatter. <laughs> yes, yes. But yes, thank you everyone for going through these three journeys with me. It was a lot of fun and I hope you enjoyed it too.